and welcome to our screencast about the people of this step and about Chinggis Khan. In this video, I'm going to take you through what life was like in the area around modern Mongolia before Chinggis Khan and the thousands of years before him, and talk a little bit about his life and his growth and his path to the leadership of the Mongols before he uh, created his very famous and important empire. So the first place, the place I want to start here may seem a little odd, but it's a little bit of geography, and is that this place is incredibly beautiful. Look at those mountains, look at that plains. Man, do you not want to go there? Oh. Something that you'll notice about this landscape, apart from the beauty, is that it's dotted by these small white things. You may know what those are, you may recognize them as homes, as uh, what the Mongolians might call yurts or gares. And these are Mongolian homes, which are quite incredible because they can move around easily. You might be thinking something like this. I'm not saying that didn't happen, but that's actually not the main way that they move. They are actually able to be broken down uh, and then moved from place to place on carts like this, which, again, blows my mind. But even while that happens, they still maintain a beautiful homey atmosphere on the inside. So even just from this beginning first picture of the beautiful mountains and the gares spread out through it, we get a, a beginning to what life is like or life was like uh, in the time of Genghis Khan before Genghis Khan um, in the Mongolian steppe. And just in case you don't know the word steppe, it's the large plateau, very large and flat, covered with grass, good for raising horses. But we get the idea with this house that movement is very important. And in fact, the pre-Chinggis Khan Mongolians and uh, other people of the steppe were a nomadic pastoralist people. And we'll get to that a little bit more. I think I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Let's go back in time. And I want to show you something that was in this area of Mongolia starting about 80,000 years ago. And that was people. And we have evidence like these cave paintings from that area, which suggest that people lived there from then. Now, we don't know much about those people. They were probably, judging by the date, uh, not pastoralists, they would have been what? Hopefully you said hunter-gatherers. Um, we think that the, the lifeways, that the nomadic pastoralist lifeways, probably began at least by 300 BCE, where we see strong evidence of iron tool use, and that would probably connect with uh, that idea of nomadic pastoralism. So from that time, we had a strong cultural complex in that area, possibly living in houses like the ones I've shown you, probably using arrowheads like that, and definitely using these animals. Horses were and have been and are a key part of Mongolian life uh, throughout that time, for at least the last 2,000 years. Horses play a lot of roles in the society. They're, as, as the main animal being raised, they would be a, a statement of prestige, of, of money almost, they do the currency, um, but they are also used for transportation, for hunting in this case. Uh, you have to be able to ride. Traditions say that Mongolians ride horses from a very young age, but also horses are an important source of food. So um, meat in the worst of times, but more generally cheese and milk uh, coming from horses and some other livestock make an, up an important part of the Mongolian diet even today and definitely were key to the diet um, a thousand years ago, leading up to the time of Chinggis Khan. But the horse was not just a form of sustenance, it was also key in its role as the warrior's mount. And the area uh, of the steppe was this essential part to a number of violent struggles, sometimes nomads against other nomads, but often nomads against settled peoples for various reasons, trade differences, uh, for raiding purposes, sometimes the settled peoples invaded the nomadic territory, and so in retaliation. Um, but the nomads were well known for their incredible abilities as horsemen and as, as you can see in this picture, as bowmen. So their abilities to shoot arrows from, the, from horseback, very well known and very well feared. Culturally and linguistically, before Chinggis Khan, there's no single written language of that area. Um, but there was definitely oral traditions and uh, stories passed down. And there was a very strong shamanistic culture, which in some ways still continues today, and definitely was strong in Chinggis Khan's time. And if you remember from our study of traditional belief systems, um, 
the shamanistic belief is that there's a, a a spiritual world and a physical world and that the interaction between those two worlds can be governed by certain human beings who are shaman. I'm going to talk a little bit about Chinggis Khan in a second, but before we do that, I want to give you a few more details using what we've already seen about the world that he would have lived in. For one thing, what we know about nomadic pastoralists is that there are not a lot of class differences. There may be a higher and lower, but their lives would be quite similar, at least compared to their contemporary counterparts in China uh, or in settled areas at that time. So a relatively egalitarian social system, and one where women probably had a greater role, again, than in uh, societies that are more settled. Economically, we've talked about the importance of horses, uh, possibly as currency, definitely for sustenance. But other economic, key economic factors would be the production of tools and things like the, uh, the houses, arrowheads, other metal tools. Um, but they also are well known as raiders and traders, so both willing to interact with settled people, trading if possible, raiding if necessary, uh, taking what they have to if they... Finally, politically, Mongolia at that time was quite decentralized, with power broken up amongst a number of tri tribes and chiefdoms, and the leaders within those tribes and chiefdoms did not have as much power as, say, a Chinese emperor or even an Egyptian pharaoh, and the leaders relied on their subjects for support. The closest thing pre Chinggis Khan Mongolians had to a centralized government was an event called the Kurutai, which was essentially an election of a main chief by the other chiefs. So if, that, if one chief could get enough support from other chiefs, they would elect him and recognize him as their leader. And that event becomes important in the story I'm about to tell you about Chinggis Khan. This is a painting of Chinggis Khan that was done after his death. As far as I know, we don't have many or any portraits of him while he was actually alive. This is one that was uh, Chinese, but he has a very interesting story. He was born in the late 1100s. Um, I think sources either say 1155 or 1167. And by his death in 1227, he had conquered huge amounts of Asia, and his sons and grandsons would go on to create the largest land empire the world had ever seen. But I want to tell you about how he got his start. And one of the key things is that his father was a well-known chief, a high, highly ranking chief uh, within the Mongolian tribes that he grew up in. But while when Chinggis Khan was quite young, around the age of nine, his father was poisoned and died. And uh, Chinggis Khan's tribe essentially kicked his mother out. And he so he had a rough childhood working with his brothers to get enough food. So his early life was quite rough. Uh, at one point, he was actually captured by another group and held captive, and he was only able to escape with the help of his friends. But from there, he started to gain power and credit among the other Mongolian chiefs. And eventually, he was uh, elected at a Kurultai as the head chief, the head Khan of the Mongolian tribes at that time. And from there, there was no turning back. He managed to use his power as the head Khan, centralize it, uh, get rid of his adversaries, conquer the neighbor neighboring nomadic peoples, and then go on to conquer, essentially, everybody else in the world. And that's where I'll leave it right now. But as we move on, we're going to talk more about the Mongolian expansion, which is a well-known topic, and eventually about the impact that Chinggis Khan and his empire had on world history. Thank you very much.